to Mission Promise, Navigating Special Education for Military Families. I'm your host, Mary, and a fellow military spouse. I'm so excited to be here with you, sharing stories, insights, and resources that can help military families like ours navigate the world of special education. So let's dive in. Okay, guys, today we have Meg Flanagan. She's an educator and advocate, and she's also the owner of Meg Flanagan Solutions, a consulting business where she helps parents understand their child's education. Welcome, Meg. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Mary. Yes, and I'm glad that you were able to come on. So if you want to go ahead and just, you know, go into a little bit more details about your background and who you are for our listeners, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, I'm Meg. I have a master's in special education. And my thesis was on autism treatments and their effectiveness. Again, that was probably back in 2009. So things have changed. I also have an undergrad degree in elementary education. I'm licensed in Massachusetts and Virginia in both areas. And I have taught in public school, private school for a consulting company and own my own tutoring business for a time. And now I am an intervention teacher part-time and also a special education advocate, really focusing on military families around the world. Nice. That's awesome. So today we're going to be talking about Dodeo. <laughs> we're just going to go mm-hmm. and get into that. So if you want to explain exactly what Dodeo is and the difference between Dodeo and regular public school. Absolutely. Dodeo stands for D- Department of Defense Education Action. It has gone by many names over the years. Dodds, is one of them. And you're going to hear it called one of the previous acronyms sometimes. But in general, it's DODEA, D-O-D-E-A. They operate federally funded K-12 or now pre-K to 12 public schools on military bases. It's like a little spider web of things. So there's the continental U.S. DODEA, which operates on military bases east of the Mississippi, but only on certain military bases. So for example, I'm thinking in Virginia, there's Quantico, Virginia, which does have a Dodea pool. And then there is Fort Belvoir, Virginia, literally less than 50 miles away. They have an elementary school on base. It's not Dodea operated. It's operated by the local public school district. So that is a huge source of confusion for many military families because you roll up to Camp Pendleton. There are schools physically located on the base, Mm -hmm. but they're not operated by DODEA. They are operated by the local school district. So it is really important when you are going to a different base to clarify, is the school on base operated by DODEA or is it operated by the LEA, the local education agency? So that's CONUS DODEA. Then there's also OCONUS DODEA or um, DODEA schools located overseas. These are grouped into different areas. There is a Europe area generally that's split into East and West. And then there is an Asia Pacific area. And that is Korea, Japan, Guam. And then there is a third and lesser known factor and factor for Dodea. And that is for families that are located overseas in places that are far away from a Dodea school. So perhaps you have embassy duty. And DODEA will help sometimes facilitate that, like where you put your kid for school if you are, say, located in Kiev, uh, where there is not a DODEA-owned school. One of the things that is confusing is that DODEA schools have qualifiers to enroll in them, especially for families that are maybe new to the military. There is on-base housing and off-base housing. If you are living in the U.S. and you happen to be stationed at a location where there is an on-base DODEA-operated school, you must live physically on the base in order to attend. If I'm living on, say, Quantico, I have to be physically living in base housing. I can't live in Stafford and send my kid to the DODEA school. I have to be living on Quantico. So that is a confusing piece because you think, oh, great, I'm going to go to Lejeune. I'm going to go to, I'm a Marine Corps spouse, so my knowledge is all Marine Corps bases. (laughs) Great, I got stationed at Lejeune. I can send my kids to the DODEA school at Lejeune. False. Unless you're offered and accept these housing on Camp Lejeune, you're going to the regular public school. Wow. Overseas, the rules are different. If the DODEA schools are available to all eligible dependents, people who are there. So there's different categories of eligibility. 
So active duty service members with command sponsored dependents are eligible. So if you are given accompanied orders to Okinawa and your spouse and your kids or your kids move with you, your kids can enroll, no questions asked, at the Dodea school. Some families choose to move without command sponsorship, meaning their service member got orders and they did not get command sponsored. This gets a little trickier and I am not overly familiar with that, but in general, my understanding is that it's a no-go. You don't have command sponsorship. You're not authorized to be in that location and you are there on a tourist visa. Really? So like in Okinawa, unaccompanied tours are pretty common. They're limited military medical resources overseas. I remember when we were living in Okinawa, if you had a really significant like complication with your pregnancy, Okinawa was the hub for complicated pregnancies in Asia Pacific. People would fly into Oki from mainland Japan, from Korea, from Guam, and they had a whole barracks where they could put expectant mothers in case there was something, because that was like the triage. Right. But if your case is more severe than what Okinawa can handle, you get sent to Tripler. Yep. So you're going to Hawaii, baby. And if Tripler can't handle it, you're going to San Diego. So there are different categories. And this is where EFMP, the Exceptional Family Members Program, really comes into play because military families have to be screened in order to go anywhere right. overseas. So I think you guys, when we were screened to go to Oki, I had to go, I had to get all of my medical records since like I was born uh -huh. with all of my medications, my entire medicational history, all of my vaccine records, everything for my kid. We had to go to like multiple physical exams. We had to sit through a questionnaire about our psychological history and whether or not taking like antidepressants was going to prevent me from accessing care. And that is based on what services are available at the Dodea school. And at the MTF, for example, Okinawa does not or did not, I should say, caveat, this is like 2016 to 2019. They didn't have an ABA provider, the public school, and there wasn't a TRICARE authorized provider in the local economy. Because in order to be a TRICARE authorized but private provider, you would have to get licensed in Japan and then contract. It's like a whole thing. It's a whole thing. There was one person who did tutoring, but did it with an ABA like flavor. Mm -hmm. She was a BCBA, but she just did it as a tutoring business at one point. She left when I did. I don't know if anyone has come in. So that's an example of very limited resources. Also, if you look on the Dodea website, if you just search Dodea IEP categories or disability categories, Dodea, there is a whole spreadsheet chart thing that tells you what services are provided at which locations and what levels are provided. So it could be like levels one, two, and three. So if you are less severe level or less hands-on level, that might be fine for you because you have up to level three intensity of speech. Right. But if you're beyond that, if you are a more severe level, then you might not get the services that you are required to have in your IEP. Wow. And that's at the school. So that they'll tell you like what they have, what category of special education classrooms they have. And so unlike a stateside, like generic Hawaii public schools, Fairfax County public schools, where you get the kids you get and you just have to roll with it and you have to staff the positions for the kids you have. If they don't have, say, a LIMS classroom and they have all different acronyms than the regular general education right public schools. Completely different world. If they don't have it, they don't have it. And they might not necessarily create that position yes. for one child. Yeah. Going back to my original point, unaccompanied. You really want to be real careful if your child has a disability and you're thinking maybe you want to be not command sponsored. You are lowest on the totem pole on the MTF. You are lowest on the totem pole for Dodea. And you're trying to figure out that tourist visa unless you can somehow get your own work visa and SOFA status to work on base. So that's that. There's other eligibility categories. Sometimes contractors, depending on their classification, can send their children to school. The other thing that was really interesting to me is that not all contractors or DOD employees qualify to send their children to Dodea schools as if it's a public school. So if I was stationed in Germany, my children could just enroll for free. It's covered by the federal government. 
However, there's some classifications of students where they are not allowed to enroll as if it's a public school. And in that regard, Dodea sometimes acts like a private school. Wow. With charging tuition. When I had a friend who, who experienced that in Okinawa, where she needed to enroll her child in a school that provided special education services because Japanese schools weren't it, she ended up homeschooling because Dodea wanted to charge her tuition because her husband was a contractor and not a regular DOD employee. I had no idea. It's it's Forever. like I tell you every single day, Mary, I learned something new about Dodea that like puts a little extra wrinkle in it. Mm-hmm. So another example would be the funding source. So if you're enrolled at the public schools, wherever you're stationed, and they're not Dodea, the funding source comes from the local tax base and the state, which then answers the State Department of Education, which then answers to U.S. Ed, right? U.S. Department of Education. Dodea is funded by DOD, by DOD. It comes from a federal pot of money. So the funding stream is slightly different. So if, for example, you had a complaint or a concern you're not just taking on, say, your particular school and that admin team and that chain of command. You are taking on DODEA, which is many schools across the entire world, and the DOD. Wow. Yeah. Which has deep pockets. <laughs> so it's like a whole thing. It's a whole thing. So that's DODEA in a nutshell. What other questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. That is a lot. It's a lot. Wow. Going back, still just like thrown from the fact that, you know, if you don't live on base, you can't go to the to the schools. But, you know, there's been plenty of instances where, you know, there are bases that you don't qualify. Like if you're a certain rank, you don't qualify. So you can't live on base. And so because I don't qualify and I can't live on base, so my kid can't go to to the school on base. That's insane. If it's a Dodea yeah. school. So the other flip side is that so Dodea used to be. Many iterations ago, long before you or I probably carried into the military, they used to be nationwide. There used to be schools run by the, the Department of Defense on all the military bases or many of them, right? So I'm thinking like particularly of Fort Belvoir. So there's physical school buildings on Fort Belvoir. They're just operated by Fairfax County. So at some point, the school the local school and the state board of education and the department of defense came together and decided, and there's docu, there's articles about this that are much more eloquent than me yeah. to explain it, but they came up with a, not necessarily a cost sharing, but a responsibility sharing where the department of defense now has the buildings on their base. And so military kids like Balfour is huge. And so you have the school on base. And so it is going to be majority military kids. Mm -hmm. And that's the zone that you're pulling from. You're pulling from the base. But the teachers are from Fairfax County. It's the same with, I want to say Mary Fay Elementary on Camp Pendleton. It's physically on base, but it's an Oceanside Unified Public School. There's another one. There's two or three on Camp Pendleton. I want to say there's some up in Massachusetts, like maybe on Fort Devens. They're dotted around. So just because a school building is on base doesn't mean that that it's operated by Dodea, which is incredibly confusing. Because you roll up and you're like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Department of Defense. Here we are. I needed an ID to get onto this location. Wow. But no, it's staffed by regular public school teachers. It's safe to say that, you know, as military families, definitely do your research prior to going to these duty stations as far as knowing whether, even though the school is on base, it doesn't mean that it's still there. So definitely do that. And especially going overseas, Mm -hmm. like my kids and I, we went through the whole process of the overseas screening because my husband went to Guam, both did a change of home port, but we ended up staying here in Hawaii. So we did a geobatch tour, but just that whole process alone was tedious. Just like you said, me having to get since birth all my records and stuff. Yeah. It's a process. Yeah, it was a lot. And you'd be surprised at the things. And and so that's I think the other part that's really confusing for families is that as people that are involved in the disability education community, mm-hmm. we're well versed in special education law. Section 504 says, IDEA says, but if the military tends to trump that. So they're not going to want to send a kid with cardiology concerns 
to a place where there's not a pediatric cardiologist right. because there, there's a high probability then that the military member will not be mission focused. Mm -hmm. So it's better for them like you to stay in location and send the military member unaccompanied. And there are a lot of families that do that through the EFMP process where they're like, oh, heck no, all my doctors are in Baltimore. I can't move. I, I don't want to move my kids away from Fort Meade to go to Vegas. Right. That's silly. <laughs> I don't know anyone there. Everyone's in, everyone's at Hopkins. So they'll elect to do an independent or self-directed geobatch tour where they're splitting the family voluntarily. But the other thing is that it's a lot of moving parts is what I have discovered over the last seven years yeah. of being an advocate and 15 years of being a military spouse is that it is so many puzzle pieces that have to slot together exactly right and that things can get dropped. So for example, I have a life-threatening dairy allergy. It is all over my medical records. You would be shocked at the number of times that people have missed it. It's been left off what? my medical records, like completely left off that people just didn't know, like doctors who were seeing me for months on end were like, oh, you have a dairy allergy? Wow. Yeah, surprise. Oh my. I could die. And, but that wasn't brought up when I went to Okinawa. They were never like, oh, EpiPens might be hard to get there. Wow. That that was never brought up. But the fact that I had been in therapy a year and a half prior. Yeah, for, that was brought up. Of course. Concern, of course. That was brought up multiple times. And there was a lot of concern about, about me going because of that. Wow. Getting a therapist, getting my meds wasn't easy. It wasn't it wasn't easy, but it wasn't insurmountable. Right. Versus Having something life threatening. Made. You're out. Come on. Right? Really? Yeah. And so that happens more often than I think anyone wants to admit, right. where there's a family going conus or oconus, dodea or not, that something is missed or they need the service member in that location so desperately that they're willing to overlook it to get the person in situation. And they know that the person's going to refuse orders or request alternate orders or request a shortened unaccompanied tour if the family can't go. And so they're going to, they're willing to waive things. DOD is willing to waive things. Say, yeah, of course you can go to wherever. But no one has thought to be like, okay, so does the IEP actually match the stated services in the Dodea school? Does the medical record actually match the MTS? And so there's a lot of disconnect between those things, especially overseas. The other piece that I think isn't talked about widely, and I am willing to stick my neck out on this, is that the hiring process for Dodea can take upwards of three months. So from the time of first interview and initial preferment of offer, hey, we'd like to offer you this job, mm -hmm. to the day a teacher might set foot in their classroom, could be three months. Even if you're offered an acceptor to job in July, you might not be in your physical classroom with pay until October. Yeah, school is already in session. School is already in session. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so there have been cases that I've been tracking where positions have been unfilled, intermittently filled with permanent staff or staffed by a rotation of substitutes for years like more than one school year. I believe it. And that sucks for the kids, especially the ones who need that constant routine and it doesn't mm -hmm. adjust well to change. That's a whole nother layer. Oh. That's, that is a whole, it's a whole other thing. And then there's different kinds of Dodea employees. There's, so when I was in Okinawa, there were local hires, and this is true for Stateside and Oconas. There's local hires. It's people who happen to already be co-located. So you're a spouse got orders to Okinawa. You're a licensed teacher. You go through the process. They're not going to pay you the housing allowance. There's like additional stipends that non-local hire teachers get. Right. So if you decided right now, hey, I want to be a Dodea teacher anywhere in the world, you could apply. And there's like additional stipends. There's moving allowances. There's housing allowances. There's COLA allowances on top of your base salary. So you get your base salary based off of just like everywhere else, education and experience in the field. But then there's additionals. Housing, there's like a travel stipend. You can go, they pay for you to go back to the States if you're overseas, like once a year to your home address. There's all sorts of like little extra things that they tack on to make it really enticing because you are located overseas. Right. But they also have 
even within that category of not local hires, like not military spouse hires, there are additional rules. Like some people are permanent and they will be, say, in Okinawa for 30 years or the length of however they want to stay with Zodea. There's another category that moves like military members. So they might be in Okinawa for three years and then they're going to be in Germany and then they're going to be somewhere else. And that might not happen with the school year. So it might be in December, they're PCSing to a different school. And so that position mid-year is now open. Yeah, there's a lot of intricacies for not just special education, but general education in Dordea in terms of staffing and teacher hiring timelines and when teachers are going to be there in the classroom physically. The acronyms are all different. It's just very complicated. Is no, it's I'm, complicated. It is. The other piece that military family members should be aware of is, so when you're at a school in Hawaii or a school in Virginia, IDEA is the law of the land, right? It, it is federal law. You have to follow it. Yes. Can states tweak the eligibility? Like they can tweak small little parts of it, but they can never go below the baseline. Dodea operates within DOD. And so they have a DOD memo, manual, DODM. It's um, 1342.12 if you want to look it up. And it outlines that they will accept IDEA and follow IDEA. And I want to say there's some caveat language in there to the, it's like to the best of our ability or something. And so that language is important to pay attention to. That's good to know. And you really got to read the parent special education manual for DOD. Read all of it, all um, the fine print. Read every, every word, get your highlighter out, get yourself a screen reader, pull it up in PDF, listen to that baby on repeat because you want to memorize it because they're are things, even having supported families in DOD schools for the last seven years, there are things in there that still catch me by surprise. Wow. Like that caveat language. You say what resources are available for parents or students that are having to navigate through the DODEA system? Okay, yeah. So the first stop for every military family should be their school liaison officer. It is important to note that the school liaison officer is not able to advocate for you one-on-one. -on -one. They're not able to go with you to IEP meetings or 504 plan meetings. They can raise your family's individual concern, but they are not going to represent you like a private professional advocate would. So that is something to note. They offer trainings. They are so good at trainings. They have tons of, they'll often offer IEP 101 trainings, 504 101 trainings gifted education trainings, even in stateside, they do the same thing. They'll tell you how to register. They'll send you to the right school based on where you live. Oh, you live at, you know, so and such and such address. The zone school for you is this at this grade level. They might have information about private schools that are available, but they will not be able to say, oh, you should absolutely enroll in X school or try to choice into Y school based on your kid's learning profile. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get that deep. So that's something to know. Partners in Promise also has tons of amazing yeah. resources, which I am thrilled about. <laughs> All of their like PCS resources and trainings are fabulous. Even if you are located overseas, every single state in the country has a parent education center. They're all called different things. So it, it could be like a Google of special education parent advocacy center in your state. In Virginia, it's the Parent Training Education and Advocacy Center, as I think the acronym for it. In Georgia, it's like parent to parent, but they offer trainings, resources, and you don't have to live in Virginia to take the Virginia trainings. Some of it might not just be relevant right. to you, but the resources are there and they're free and they're online. So take advantage of that. In the NDAA that Partners in Promise helped pass a few years ago, there was the info about the special education lawyers and advocates being available. That is, to my knowledge, still rolling out. Yeah. And that is amazing. They do have some limitations based on the service. Some services are still refusing to represent people in court. And so they might act more in an advisory capacity. The sticky thing is that overseas, they are pulling from the same pot of money. So they are both DOD employees and that 
could lead to issues with representation and conflict of interest. Yeah. And so that is sticky. Another great resource is Exceptional Families of the Military, EFM. They are working really heavily on the medical side of things and the therapeutic side of things to get information put before members of Congress to help people understand like how to navigate child care and how to do these two things that really do need to happen together with medical therapeutic side and educational side for military kids with disabilities to really thrive. So they're doing, Austin Carrick's doing such a great job over there. The other thing is that there's a law program through, I want to say the American Bar Association, where sometimes education lawyers will offer pro bono services or heavily discounted services to military family members. So definitely check out the American Bar Association for that. Yeah. So that's a really cool thing. And every single family, no matter where you live, you are able to hire whatever representation you so desire. So you can hire a personal advocate. It's going to be at your expense. But having a qualified expert to represent you, the caveat being is that there is no criteria to become an advocate. So anyone can hang out their shingle. I feel fairly confident advocating for people because I I have 15 years in the field and a master's in special ed and I have a master IEP coach certification and I've written hundreds of IEPs at this point. And there are lots of other military spouses that do the same thing that I do with great qualifications as well. So definitely, if you're hiring an advocate, make sure that they are qualified, educated, knowledgeable, and more than just knowledgeable about special education generally, knowledgeable about DODEA special education, because it is, as we've said, a different beast entirely. It's shocking how different things are. You can also hire an attorney. The challenging thing that many families have found, though, is that if you are in DODEA, your attorney will have to be... I'm not sure if the right terminology, so I might be getting this wrong, but they might, they have to be federally barred. They have to be able to argue in federal court. So they might be bought like a Virginia barred lawyer. But if they're not able to argue in federal court, then I don't know if they can represent you because you're going against a federal entity. So that is definitely something to ask. Like there's a military spouse lawyer network, MSJDN. I think that's it. They are so knowledgeable about everything law and military connected that it's um, it's a fabulous resource and they're very responsive. So those are all the resources that are available to you. There's tons out there. It truly is just figuring out what resource. So if you're arriving at a place and you're not really sure, the slow is definitely your first stop. But if you're in a knockdown drag out with the school, the slow is likely not going to be your best option. You could find an advocate locally, especially overseas with SOFA law. There are lots of military spouse educators that are unable to get a job on base because there's just not enough jobs. So you might find a neighbor or a friend that is knowledgeable in special education that will go with you. You might want to hire an advocate to go with you in person or virtually. You might want to see about if the lawyers, the military lawyers are able to help you or if you want to pursue hiring your own legal representation. There's a lot of different options. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I like how you started this one. So we're going to talk about Dota. <laughs> and then it's just been like 30 minutes of me talking at but you. No, about it's, it's like good because I'm learning. Minutia. As you're talking, I'm learning. I'm like, wow, because some of the stuff I did not know. So I'm just like, okay, wow, this is great. Absolutely not. <laughs> and the thing about it that kind of that kind of baffles me or like amuses me the most is that it is so, Dodea is organized like the military. So it is a command structure. They have the teachers are like the boots on the ground. They are the low level hanging fruit. They're the guys who are going to do the work and do it well. Then you got building admin and those are like your NCOs. They are overseeing their jurisdiction. They are organizing in their building. Then you have like regional admin, then you have area admin and regional and area are two different things, apparently, because there's like someone that's like the superintendent of just these schools in this location. But then there's someone that's like the superintendent of all the schools in all of these locations. And then there's like another superintendent for all the schools (laughs) in this region. And then there's Dodea HQ, which is like all the schools everywhere. 
And you have to like, there's like check boxes along the way. Like you can't level up like military chain of command. If your immediate platoon leader isn't like doing whatever and you have a complaint, then you go to the next level up. Mm -hmm. You you skip the, you skip the sergeant, you go to lieutenant. A lieutenant's not, you go to the captain, you go to the major, you keep going up and up and up until you get to the top. But there's 20 layers up to the top in Dodea. So there's, that's really fun. The other things to know are as disability education people, there are still due process mediation. So you can file for facilitated IEP meetings, which means someone from one of the other, like the higher admin levels will come in and be at your IEP meeting with you, either virtually or in person to kind of lead things along. You can enter mediation. Again, that would be through higher level district admin. You can go into due process to file a complaint to get things resolved. They can still offer compensatory services when they fail to provide free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. I will say that proving that is incredibly difficult. Mary can see my face (laughs) right now. And yeah, it's difficult. In my estimation, it is more difficult than proving it in the public school, even a big public school. Wow. It's more difficult. The other thing to know is that military family members, you can sue, but getting your case to court is going to be expensive and time consuming and soul sucking. You can file an IG complaint. So there's that. It works about as well as you might expect. Yeah. I'm sorry if this is really honest. We need the truth. And so this is great. Girl, I've seen some things. (laughs) I've seen some things. I have seen some meetings where I have left and I have cried. Because I'm just, I'm so sick internally about what just happened to my client. Yeah. Just like nauseous about what happened to them. Staying up late at night thinking about what's happening to them and how we have on paper all of these safeguards in in effect. We have federal law, two federal laws that should protect our kids in DODEA. We have the NDAA, which should protect our kids in DODEA. We have all of these stop gaps, the due process, the mediation of facilitated IEP. We have the onus for compensatory services when things don't go well. And it is so challenging to get these things done and so costly that it's frustrating on a personal and professional level. And I am so glad that Partners in Promise is willing to stick their neck out with me and be like, hey, this is not okay. It is not okay anymore that these children, the most vulnerable of our military kids, are stuck in situations where they are being told to make do with nothing, where there are positions unstaffed for years or being staffed by a rotation of potentially unlicensed subs. Not to say that the substitute teachers and substitute staff doesn't have a great heart and they're not doing the right things. They very likely, in most cases, are doing the right things. ESSA and IDEA stipulate that it has to be a highly qualified, certified special education teacher, which means someone with a degree who has passed certification tests Mm -hmm. to be in that position. And if we're staffing a mod severe classroom with a rotation of subs that are just pulled from a pool, then are we providing SAPE in the LRE? That is crazy you bring that up because I literally witnessed that about a year and a half ago. I was working as an RBT and there was no special ed teacher. So they just had subs coming in and out. And mind you, this classroom, we had two students that were very like aggressive. And so they required two on one RBTs, two on one services. And I was on one of them. And, you know, teachers literally, they would see, you know, situations going down and they would just exit the room. And it's just like, okay. But as an RBT, we still need someone from the school in this room with us, monitoring us. Nobody was equipped. And that went on for the whole school year. And it's like the IEP meetings will come up and the parents and, you know, me, because, you know, working with Partners in Promise and having my own child who, you know, is on EFMP, both medical and educational side. And I'm wanting to just put a parent to the side and just. You don't know what's going on, you know, but it's a conflict and it's just watching that. I said, I just, I can't do this anymore, but it's not talked about enough. And it's stories and situations, the unforeseen and and just like, it's crazy that these things are happening, but it needs to be talked about more. So that way change can happen or (laughs) yeah, it's yeah. So I definitely understand. 
the PR spin that's coming out is, oh, Dodea has the top scores of whatever. They're better than these like 17 good things. What they're not telling you is that a lot of their overseas locations don't have a large population of students with disabilities. Or if they have students with disabilities, it's kiddos that are what we used to call high-functioning kids with autism, kids that are very intelligent and able to be in general education, kids with ADHD, kids with dyslexia. They're not telling you that part. And so state science schools, yeah, they have to take who they get, right? Yeah. So it could be a kid with cerebral palsy or Down syndrome or, or severe autism. But overseas, they're able to filter because of the EFMP process. So it's not a come one, come all. It's kids that don't have educa- significant educational needs, kids without significant medical issues, kids whose parents don't have significant medical issues. They leave out the part where the majority or a significant population of families with children in Dodea schools are two-parent families, where if both parents aren't earning a full-time income, it might be a full-time income and a part-time income, or one parent who stays at home and is solely the parent for the kids. They're leaving out the fact that all of the kids in these in our Dodea schools have access to excellent health care. They have a reliable income for their families. They have reliable money going to housing. Might it be the best amount of money for housing? One could argue no. Might it be the best on base housing again? Perhaps not. Is it a roof over their head where they are able to be safe as much as we can make them be safe without literally being in the home with them, protecting them from all of the, all of the nuances that go on in, in a family? These are kids that are coming from, if not a place of privilege, at least a place of not stability either. Reasonable security in terms of health care, food on the table. One could argue, again, that is not a thing. Housing. There's a level of stability here that is perhaps not echoed in other portions of the population. Yeah, you're absolutely And so right. I, I think they're leaving out some nuances when they tell us that Dode is doing so darn great. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's a lot. Yeah, it, it's just, it's a system, right? And you have to play the system and you have to also know that like public schools, the system is stacked against you as a parent of a child with a disability. You have to know your rights. You have to know them inside and out, backward and front, get them tattooed on your arm. You got to know what you need and you have to be able to access your resources, whether it's a free resource, whether it's finding a neighbor to go with you to IEP meetings so that their jaw can hit the floor as well as yours or just to hold you when you cry because we've all been there as teachers and parents and professional paid advocates, or whether it's an advocate or an attorney to, to go with you and just mean mug up every once in a while. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> you coming on today and talking with us. And I'm sure once our listeners hear this episode, they're, yeah, their mouth's going to drop. <laughs> they're going to be floored. Here's the thing is that there are thousands, if not millions of families out there that have incredible experiences at Dodea. So I'm yeah. not saying that Dodea is a bad school system. I think that it is fabulous. Absolutely. For some kids, just like every school is fabulous for some kids. I mean, you could have my family and your family could have kids the same exact age with the same exact disability or diagnostic profile and in the same exact classroom. And you and I could walk away with two different experiences, Mm -hmm. even if all things are otherwise equal income level. Whether we're professionally educated as parents, whether our spouses are educated and in a professional capacity, all of these other things could be exactly equal. And you and I could walk away with two very different experiences, which I think that also gets lost in the conversation because I I see all the time on military spouse boards of tell me about XYZ school for my kid with blah. And I want to say no one else's experience is going to tell you what it's going to be like. Yes, I can't tell you that your kid with autism is going to thrive at a school in this county because three other kids had a good experience. Your kid might not get the same teacher. They might get the same teacher, but in a different year. And maybe she's pregnant. Maybe he just lost a parent. Maybe he's having a really bad year and he's not, that teacher is not able to be present in the way they were before. Maybe there's been a change in admin. Maybe there's some new testing requirements. Maybe there's a new learning standard. Maybe there's a funding source cut. And so that is all relative. So when we're talking about whether a school district is good or not good, you have to do your own homework on this. And I tend to hate when people say, do your own homework, do your own research. But in this, you have to. You have to look at state 
testing scores. Fun fact, we should all check to see when Dodea last released their testing scores and what that looked like. I'm going to have you look that up on your own because I don't have those numbers in front of me, but you should. And reach out to other people, other parents in the community, 100% reach out to other parents in the community. If you're looking at a regular public school that is not Dodea, do not, for the love of all that is sacred, rely on the rating websites that I will not name. There are a lot of factors that go into those ratings. So I will give you a personal example. My kids go to a school that's rated maybe a two or three out of 10 on those rating websites. It is fully bilingual K-5. Every child starting in fourth grade has the opportunity to join band or orchestra. Instruments are provided. Or chorus, they do two concerts a year. They go on multiple field trips every year, every single grade. They have inclusion specialists who loop into the classrooms. They have a deep bench of special education and gifted education. They have three or four vice principals, one of whom is just special education. So she just handles IEPs and 504 plans. They have a psychologist at the school. This is a a two or a three out of 10. Wow. It is a two or a three out of 10 because 50% of the population are at or below the poverty level. 50% of the population are learning English as a second language. They're getting free lunch. And, but the school itself is physically located in a very wealthy neighborhood where a lot of families have opted to go into private school. So it skews the data. So you're looking at the neighborhood and you're like majority white, majority upper middle class to upper class. Mm -hmm. We're talking like million dollar homes, but the population they're pulling from are in, is a family of six in a two bedroom apartment. It's a family on food stamps. It's a family of blue collar workers who are working service jobs. Yeah. And so there's that disconnect. I think it's really important when we're looking even at test scores is that there are mitigating factors to those test scores based on race, ethnicity, language, socioeconomic status, parental education, whether your parents have jobs, one income or two income. All of those are factors that can statistically sway scores one way or the other. Kid with a two-parent household where both parents have college educations and are in a professional field and they're white cisgender male they have a without any disabilities or comorbidities they're like a typical just a kid they are statistically maybe going to have better scores yeah than the kid that is coming from a single family home and mom has to work a below minimum wage job and they are new to the country and they don't speak english and the kid has adhd like yeah it's i mean and i wish it wasn't so but that's that's so true that's so true. Yeah. So all those factors go into it, into rating a school, and not just Dodea, but everyone, right? And so when you're thinking about your Dodea school and moving overseas or moving to a base, you need to be aware of what services are available. Again, look at that Dodea service provision chart and then call the school and ask if the position is actually staffed with a permanent licensed professional. Ask for their contact information. Ask if they're rotating out soon. Talk to the school. Say, hey, we're coming in hot with this. Make sure EFMP and SLOW and the school are on board and communicating with each other. The number of times where I've seen a kiddo roll up and the IEP maybe hasn't been communicated clearly is a lot. Not through any fault, not like ever anyone ever held it back. Right. It was just maybe like at the very back of a very long packet or it was like the first two pages and not the third. There's a lot of paperwork and a lot of it is getting with, especially with the switch to Genesis or whatever we switch to in TRICARE, Genesis, Genesis maybe. That seems right. (laughs) There's a lot of different portals, a lot of different paperwork. It could be that things just didn't attach the right way. They weren't able to be downloaded. There was a permission share. You didn't come from a DOD mailing address. It's just a lot of moving parts. And I don't think anyone wants it to be this way, especially not the teachers, but it just is. Yeah. Before we go, if you want to leave like how our listeners can reach out to you if they want to, you know, utilize your services. Yeah, absolutely. It's my website is my name, Meg Flanagan, M-E-G-F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N. A A lot of A's. And you can find me online at Facebook, Instagram, X. Is that what we're calling Twitter now? X. I occasionally post there, but I'm very active on Facebook. You can email me at millkidsed at gmail.com or you can email Partners in Promise because I'm pretty sure you all have my contact information. We do. We are frequent flyers together, friends. (laughs) And good luck on everyone's journey. This is not for the faint of heart. You're doing the best. 
There's no wrong answer. There's no right answer. It just is what it is. And do your homework, do your research, make sure you read those laws because they're important. Thanks again, man. Anytime. Thank you so much for joining Mission Promise on this special education journey. We hope that our discussions, stories, and resources will provide valuable insights and support for you and your family. Remember, you're not alone in this. Stay connected with our community, share your experiences, and continue to advocate for your child's education. Together, we can make a difference. Until next time, take care and keep navigating with strength and resilience. This episode was sponsored by the USAA Foundation, whose mission is helping military families extend beyond the financial services and products they deliver and into the communities we call home. Thank you to the USAA Foundation.